Welcome to Artsplanations, the podcast that is for non-artists, artists, and everyone in between. Each week, we ask a different search engine a question related to art, and then we talk about it. Hello, and welcome back to The Conversation. I'm Andrew Malczewski, and with me as always is... Joanna Bolsons. And today, I'm very excited because we're going to be talking about a specific artist as opposed to asking a question of a search engine, and that artist is Felix Gonzalez Torres. Um, I've been a big fan of Felix Gonzalez Torres' work since I first saw his one of his pieces in the Milwaukee Museum of Fine Art when I was 15. Um, a lot of the viewpoints and impressions that I have about his work come from writings about him and interviews about him, and a lot of those can be found in a wonderful source called Felix Gonzalez Torres, edited by Julie Alt. It's a wonderful book that has a great amount of information. It's where we got a lot of the information, though not all of it, for the stuff that we're going to talk about with him. Yeah, and we'll list the book as well as other books and links to specific works we're going to talk about in our show notes, so you can hopefully find it at your local library. If not, you can maybe buy a copy and then search for the for the individual pieces that we'll talk about as well. So why don't you start us off by telling us a little bit about who Felix Gonzalez Torres is and about where he came from in his life. So Felix was born in 1957 in Cuba, and in 1970, he and his sister were sent to Madrid and stayed in an orphanage until then being sent to Puerto Rico to live with an aunt and uncle in 1971. So he's in Puerto Rico in 1971, and he then graduated from the College San George in 1976 in Puerto Rico, and he began studying at the University of Puerto Rico. From there, he moved to New York in 1979, where he got a fellowship to study at the Pratt Institute in Brooklyn, which, honestly, that was a dream of mine. <laughs> like whatever, yeah. I think that's any young artist's dream is to eventually get to Pratt, so that's amazing that he was able to accomplish that. Following Pratt, he participated in the Whitney Independent Study Program, and in that program is where he was heavily influenced by being introduced to postmodern theory. So that's where I feel like he really learned his style and learned to become the artist that we know today. Sadly, he did die from complications due to AIDS on January 9th of 1996. But that's just a short overview of where he came from. Yeah, and so a lot of his work, I mean, he was an immigrant to this country, uh, as well as being a, a gay man, a homosexual man in the early 90s, which early is... Early 80s. Early 80s, uh, which is significant because a lot of his work touches on those kind of subjects. Um, and I'll say one of the reasons why I really like his work is because that's not all it's about. It is layered and deep, and the more you kind of dig into what you see, you've find that there are multiple levels of ways of approaching and viewing it. It's very subtle. I mean, looking at his work, you you honestly don't know what you're looking at or why, and it's when you read about it and you see the subtle nuances of it, it's that's what I love about it. It's it's not something that you're going to appreciate at face value like a normal painting or a sculpture. It's definitely something that you're going to sit and think about for a while yeah and i will say his work um, like a lot of contemporary artists it does take a little bit of information and knowledge about the artist and about the subject matter to really get the full insight and the full appreciation of what they're doing so what was the first piece that you saw you said in milwaukee yeah it was in milwaukee it was one of his candy spills and so He did a number of different pieces where piles of candy were left on the gallery floor. And as you walked through the gallery, there would generally be either one of the guards or the docents who were there to tell you not to touch things. They would tell you, you can take as much as you want, take a piece or three. Which, you know, I was 15, I was really excited about art, I was just learning about it. And every other museum or gallery visit it's always don't touch yeah don't even get too close yeah, don't get too close and i am the kind of person who if there's a hanging piece of art i'm blowing on it to move it 
<laughs> I'm getting as close as I can. At, you know, I'm trying to look behind things and around things. And to have someone tell me that I could touch the work, it stuck with me. And I didn't know anything else about Felix Gonzalez Torres at that time, except that there was a pile of candy and I could take some. And I could enjoy this candy as I looked at other art. I think it's a great um, kind of thumb in the nose at the regular blue chip gallery, you know? Um, like you said, typically you're not even supposed to have a pen. I know we would always take notes and sketch in most museums but they don't even let you take ink pens for fear of damaging the work so the fact that he is encouraging or was encouraging people to take his work home and consume it that's just such a great like a few <laughs> yeah i mean his a lot of what he was doing was that he was challenging those norms though the norms of the status quo much like Duchamp or the impressionists who were also challenging the idea of the institutions and he was you know subverting this you know the sacredity of the institution of the limited quantity of art as this thing that you can only see in a museum or only people of a certain means can have this one object for him it was take it with you and the candies weren't the only ones that he did that with he also did pieces where he had posters in stacks and stacks and you could take one with you yeah what's something about them that caught your attention i think besides the first initial like oh wow i can touch this i can take it home you know it's feeling kind of like a naughty school kid yeah stealing candy just how it resonates with you afterwards it's definitely one that's heartbreaking for some of them because each candy piece is different. Yeah. But just how it sits with you and kind of sticks in your mind for for several days, if not forever. I mean, like you said, it influenced you when you were 15. And you're still an avid fan. Yeah. Um, I love having a piece that's not just something pretty, but makes me think and makes me consider how am I going to approach my work? How am I going to leave an impression, if not for a couple of days, for a lifetime? Yeah. And so, you know, that idea of challenging the the institution of the gallery of the space, this like the sacredity of art with his candy pieces and taking them with, is only one aspect of that work. He was also just challenging the government overall. He's a gay man at the height of the AIDS epidemic in the late 80s, early 90s. You know, he's marginalized not just as an artist, but as a gay immigrant. And to, to represent such an underrepresented group of people and in a positive way, when at the time, you know, they were just trying to, trying to sweep it under, under the rug and hope that it goes away. You know, they were letting people die hoping that it would just solve the the gay crisis right i mean to to represent such such marginalized people in such a positive and beautiful way that to me is incredible because if it was me you know i'd be super angry i you know i don't know i could hand if i could handle it so what's the word i'm looking for so gracefully yeah gracefully and so dignified yeah, I mean, it is it is something you have to remember that at that time, the government was ignoring that there even was an AIDS epidemic going on. Yeah. It was being called by conservatives gay cancer, you know, to demonize it as this thing that like, oh, if you have AIDS, you must be a homosexual and you got it from conducting immoral acts. Right. Um, and he was making work that was confronting these issues and bring them to the forefront of the non-gay community because also you have to memorize they didn't know how it was transmitted yeah you know it because nobody was addressing it as an actual crisis and so if you found out that someone had aids you didn't know that it was sexually transmitted you didn't know if it came from touching them it was from, airborne yeah. sharing a glass of water one other thing i want to say about the candy pieces is um the one that he called Untitled for Ross. So in 91, his lover Ross died from AIDS. And one of the stacks of candies was 171 pounds, which was the weight of 
his lover, and as you take a piece of candy, it loses weight much like you would if you were an AIDS patient. Your body starts to tearize, you start to get sick, you lose weight in the sickness and eventually die. Eventually those pieces disappear. And learning about that, that aspect to the work is something that's also sad with me because it's, you know, there are these it's bright, heartbreaking. it's heartbreaking. And the candies there, you know, depending on which piece of candies he's doing, they're brightly wrapped in colorful cellophane. They're generally, you know, a chocolate or a peppermint or a fruit flavor, something warm and bright and fun. And as you consume this, you're taking a little piece away from something that he loved or this representation of a person who he loved. Um, and I thought that idea and those ideas, the layer of them from just fighting the institution and changing the rules of it to representing, you know, this epidemic and this crisis, also this idea of loss and consumption. It's you know. those subtle layers that, again, you don't initially see on your first glance. Right. And it's, again, one of those pieces that just stick with you. Yeah. There's also, I mean, another layer that's part of those is the consumer culture this idea of capitalism and like oh we're in late stage capitalism we consume 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 until it's gone yeah and when you're in the gallery you go in they're like oh there's a pile i can take i can take and they don't limit what you can take and you could fill your pockets up and take as much and leave nothing for anybody else and it's up to you to kind of be part of the piece be your own moderator Moderator. yeah Um, and so those The fact that in each one of those, they have elements of those ideas in all of them. And some of them highlight one aspect more than the other, but that layer and that complexity and subtlety of making work that touches on so many different things and things that aren't just about, you know, being an immigrant or being a homosexual or AIDS. They're bigger ideals like loss, Mm -hmm. you know, universal ideals and that his ability to touch on all of them is one of the reasons why i i'm such a big fan of his work let's circle back to the politics aspect that we talked about because i really like the story of the two clocks um Mm. i think it's untitled perfect lovers yeah um two clocks counting down um you know a little bit more about this than i do so i mean so perfect lovers So all of his work is untitled, uh, and I I can't remember why he chose to leave a majority of it just untitled, and then in parentheses he'll have, like, Perfect Lovers or For Ross or Placebo, depending on... Well, I think it draws back to that it's a universal feeling. You're going to project your own interpretation on the piece, so I think leaving it untitled lets you put your own self into the work and interpret it how you want how he interprets it is in the parentheses Hmm. i think that's that's my interpretation of it no i think that's an excellent interpretation um i know one of the interviews i read of him he actually speaks to why he leaves them untitled and it's close to that oh okay but in perfect lovers it's two mechanical clocks that you could find in walmart and they are set to the exact hour, minute, and second, and put so that they are just barely touching side by side. And then they run down, and eventually one will stop as the other one keeps going, because they are imperfect in how much battery power is in them. And it's a comment on that idea of like perfect lovers, but eventually You're one of them of is gonna fall out of sync, one of them's gonna stop completely, and the other one's gonna still go. And you don't know when it's going to happen. You don't know how long it's going to take. But, you know, eventually it is going to happen. And that kind of poignant message about mortality, especially considering the fact that he was dealing with that same idea of mortality with... With Ross. Uh, with Ross, yeah. It's, again, heartbreaking. But it's so well done and so well represented that... You know, you can't say, oh, well, this is just homoerotic art or whatever, because I know a lot of politicians were trying to to deem them immoral and kind of shoo them away from being represented. So 
it was when you had a show at the Hershorn. It was Senator Stevens, who was, uh, in one of his interviews, Felix Gonzalez Torres said he was one of the most homophobic anti-art senators, and that he was looking for, you know, he was looking for butt plugs and dildos and like BDSM stuff, and like, oh, look at these, look at this homoerotic art. This is an art. This is pornography, and he had been making this case, and that's one of the reasons, one of the things that Torres did, not just about making you know, work as a homosexual, but he he completely made stuff that was against the norms in every aspect of the way that he was doing stuff. Um, you know, it wasn't that he was making gay art, but he was making his kind of art. He was making it was just art. Com- yeah, it was art. <laughs> it was a comment on gay culture yeah. or things like that. So let me give a short definition of what postmodernism is because Felix was heavily influenced by it and it's obvious in his work that he was a postmodernist. So postmodernism is or postmodernists believe that the idea that reality is not mirrored by our understanding but constructed by individuals finding their own reality. And I'll put a link to a great postmodernism book that we have and that I I read through to prepare for this episode. Um, so to kind of break that down, postmodernists don't believe that they should represent reality at face value. So they're not going to paint, you know, a landscape of their backyard. They're going to take their reality take their own interpretation of it and their individual point of view and then present it to a viewer. So Felix was doing that in a very subtle, basic human way to present it to a universal audience so that anybody could understand it. Yeah, absolutely. You know, the idea of the two clocks, it's a piece that's about mortality. And you can, and you look at it, and you're like two clocks running down. It makes sense. You get the concept and what he's talking about immediately, and it's, or even not mortality. You know, again, it's your own interpretation. Yeah. And he leaves things untitled to have your own interpretation, project your own interpretation on it. So it might mean immortality for him, but for somebody, you know, stuck in a cubicle at a dead end job, it's just time wasted yeah you know wasted years on a job you hate when you could be doing something else you know there's so many different ways to look at it which is great yeah and i think that's one of the the things with postmodern art is that it does leave flexibility for interpretation from the viewer Um, you know when we talked about what is art one of the things we talked about was that there is the artist there's the viewer and then there's the person who is generally curating the show or the artwork in a certain way and leaving room for the viewer to have the interpretation um, I think is one of the the strong points of the postmodernist movement postmodernist which I also really enjoyed reading about um, they're extremely critical of any kind of um, so postmodernists, they don't really support any kind of um, aesthetic or, you know, certain style or movement. It's very individualistic, which I like. And they, since it started in the 80s and we're living in late capitalist society, in a late capitalist society, like you said, they have a very strong distrust of really anybody in charge any kind of institution or anything um which when you looking back at the 80s is obviously understandable considering wall street you know a an epidemic that was completely ignored um what the cold war you know yeah. all these things are that are getting shoved under the rug or swept under the rug and people feel like they're not being heard 
I feel like postmodernists are trying to bring those those um, those feelings to the surface to show like this is what people are feeling, this is what they're going through, and it needs to be addressed. As people view his work, you can still you know his work is still exhibited in museums. Uh, those candy piles, when they run out, they're refilled by the museums or the gallery. How did you f approach it? You know, the first time you saw one of his candy pieces or one of his other pieces in a gallery. The first time I saw it, not in a book, was with you. And I remember you, you always walk faster than me because we have a very different style of visiting museums. But I remember you were in front of me and I saw you swoop down and grab something. And my initial reaction was like, oh God, he just like <laughs> either found something or he just touched something that he's not supposed to. And you bounded back up to me and you brought me a piece. Mm. And you were like, hey, there's candy. <laughs> and you didn't tell me that it was his work, but just seeing how happy you were made me initially happy. And then I saw it, you know, as I approached closer, I was like, oh. And I think it was, um, uh, I think it was Candy in a Corner. The, I think that's another Ross piece, Ross in L.A. maybe. But as I approached, I was like, oh, that's, you know, Felix. And so I was happy to participate. I was happy to, to be a part of the work. Because if you think about it, it could be a performance piece with the audience. But... I think my initial reaction and my initial feeling was just happiness because I was getting to experience it with you and seeing how it affected you. Hmm. That's interesting. I mean, looking at his work, we've kind of touched on how having the information about it helps to deepen the appreciation for the work. Um, I think that's true of any, any piece as well. Yeah. But... With his work, what was something that you, after reading up on him and kind of looking into his work, you found um, surprising or that you weren't expecting? I wasn't expecting so much thought put into the colors. Hmm. You know, he chooses different candies. And considering he's from Cuba, which is an island surrounded by water, you are then sent to Madrid as a teenager. So you cross an ocean. Yeah. Then you go to Puerto Rico, to another <laughs> island, and then you cross another ocean to go to New York. I wasn't expecting the blues to have such a connection to me, thinking about how much he had to travel across the seas. Mm. Um, so that was a fun little, and maybe I'm reading too much into it, um, but that was a fun little kind of um, thought that I had when looking at his work. Because there's some candy pieces where it's all rainbow colors. Yeah. Um, there's one that's like bright green. But then seeing this really pretty blue that was almost like a calm ocean, that I was like, oh, that's nice. <laughs> yeah, I think the thing that I was gra gravitated towards when I first started reading about him was that subversion of the gallery space. Chari charitability of his work, how it's meant to go with some, how you're supposed to take something with you, how you get this piece of art that you can take home. That idea of work that is not just for a few, but for everybody. Yeah. You know, that was something I was like, that is, because it is, artwork should be for everybody. And it's something that I, I honestly believe that everybody should have artwork in their house. They should make art. They should be able to view it and enjoy it. And so, you know, seeing like at first just being able to take something was fun for me, but a, later learning that it was an intentional part of a lot of what he was speaking about in his work, I found impactful. And during that time, they were having those, um, those like pop-up shows in small spaces, different um, artists in the 80s and early 90s kind of doing the same thing like we don't need a gallery you don't have to spend thousands and thousands of dollars so that the fact that he was able to get into these 
highly coveted institutions and then be like, oh no, you have to pay for the candy to replenish my work because I'm actually giving it away to your visitors. Yeah. I think that's so great. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, one of the things that if you study art and art history, you'll see that there are cyclical actions that happen throughout art history. One of them is fighting against institutions. You know, the Impressionists did it. People like Duchamp and uh, his group did it. And then you have people like Felix and Salas Torres do it. Because I think... I think artists naturally have an anarchist streak in them. I mean, there's a reason why we chose this life over being a lawyer or, you know. Yeah, I think it's also part of it is that when we, you know, learn about art, when we go to school, when we study it, where you we're told, you know, don't plagiarize, don't copy, have your own original ideas. And if you start to look at the wide breadth of artists who have come before you, it can be daunting to be like, how can I have an original idea when <laughs> so much has been done? Well, um, and it's well, who was it? Picasso said, learn to steal like an artist or something like that. Right. And it's not even that you're stealing, you're being influenced and you're learning about people like you learned about Felix and you're being influenced and you're being inspired by them. Yeah. I've always thought of it as they started a conversation and if I'm going to do work that is, you know, along the same vein as theirs, I need to add to that conversation. Yeah. You know, I don't want to repeat what they've said because they've already said it and they've done it at a point in time when it was new and it was more impactful. And if I just repeat what they say, it's, you know, it's watered down and not nearly as poignant. And also it's not my own. <laughs> and so if I'm going to do something like a ready-made by it, like, way that Duchamp does work or something where you can take something with you from the gallery like Torres it has to then I have to then make it my own and add my own voice to it my own words to add to that conversation and that's something that I mean I mentioned Duchamp because I've seen in galleries other people who do ready-mades which are just work that you basically you find it already made mm -hmm. and you put it on a pedestal with a slight change maybe and if you're not adding to the initial conversation that Duchamp started with that work, I don't see the, the point of it. Yeah. And I think, you know, that's one of the reasons why artists, I think the institution of art eventually gets to a point where people rail against what is being shown and they're like, my work doesn't have a voice in the institution because I'm pushing the boundaries. I'm thinking of how to make what has come before me my own. But it's not, you know, that stuff that's selling is not the stuff that everybody wants to see. And so you have to kind of go outside the box. I also think that they're thinking of it from a marketable stance or from a preservation stance. You know, they're having to look over years of work. You know, yeah. you take a decade at a time. They're having to look at 10 years worth of work for a decade and they're having to decide what is worthy of being representative and indicative of that decade yeah that's an impossible task and so and then on top of that what's going to sell what's going to help propel this institution forward and keep us standing that's that's heavy stuff and people are going to be left behind and people aren't going to be represented and so they're going to shake things up. They're going to say, no, you've ignored this for too long. You know, it's just like women in the gallery. There's, God, what, 80% of the paintings hung in the Met are nude women, but only 3% of the actual artists are female. You know, you're going to say, no, this has gone on for too long. You need to have more representation. And I think it's just, like you said, a, a cyclical thing. Yeah. Every so often, it's going to have to happen. And it's great that it does because who wants to remain the same? Right. It, it pushes, you know, it pushes art and arts forward. It pushes ideals and cultural um, identities forward so that you can change. You can recognize where there are things that, you know, need to change. 
you look at things like Orientalism and the Orientalist art of the 18th and 19th century, that appropriation of that culture for the people who colonized that area, like we look on it now and we go, yeah, clearly that is not the right thing to do. You yeah. shouldn't do it that way. <laughs> However, those works of art have a place in history and they remind us that we need to be better and we need to approach other cultures in a different way and have, because of those works they have helped you change kind of the way that we as artists and creators think about what we do and you can see it if you watch youtube or podcasts with just you know other creative people they are more mindful about when they use other cultural tropes and they aren't from those cultures you know i i do play a lot of like dnd and listen to those kind of podcasts and there are a lot of stereotypical transfers from like asian culture to this fantasy race or you know native american culture to this fantasy race yeah. that you start to see authors and other artists really start to be like, well, maybe we shouldn't represent them in this one-to-one -one kind of manner. Yeah. Well, if you look back on early American art, you have the quote-unquote noble savage. Yeah. We would never do that now. Yeah. You know? It, well, <laughs> we would try not to. Some would. But just that idea of, okay, this is what used to happen. Let's do better let's be better and let's move forward yeah and i think you know felix gonzalez torres his work you know the way that he presents his work and how he is placed in that history of the late 80s and 90s during that political crisis during the aids epidemic um, and the way in which he you know kind of fought those systemic issues pushes us to change it pushes us to realize like it's a good example for how we can make stuff that can affect change without alienating people who aren't from our group yeah because um, that's really it it's not that you're different or that they're different it's the fact that you're just not listening and you're just not understanding. Yeah. And that's, I like how you use the term conversation. If you just have a conversation, the differences fall away. And you realize you have universal struggles. You have universal joys. Yeah. And just like with his work, his perspective is his own. You're going to see it through your own lens. Yeah. And that's what makes it something that everybody can enjoy. So we've been kind of gushing over the things that we like about his work. Is there anything about it that you don't like or that you are critical of? Um, critical, critical. I know some of his pieces, like the hanging lights or the curtains, the oversimplification That's, yeah. is really hard for me to swallow. <laughs> and I mean, yeah, there may be a message behind why this is done this way, but it's hard for me to really want to learn about the work i think it's it's borderline minimalist which i'm not a big fan of but on that same note he knew that we lived in such a consumerist society so he was probably trying to say you don't need all that stuff yeah which then makes me like it <laughs> but on first glance i'm not a fan of minimalist so those prints that he had where it was just um, not even sentences it was like fragments I don't remember what it said but I'm not a fan of that I would probably take it just to participate right but I would roll it up and put it somewhere I wouldn't actually hang it yeah and like if I just saw some of his minimalist work in a gallery chances are I would take a look at it and be like meh and keep trucking towards other stuff um, you know, it was the engagement of the candy pieces which drew me into not just that piece, but also his wider over of work. Yeah. And for me, I mean, I'm the same way. I'm not a huge fan of minimalism. 
I'm not a huge fan of really high concept art either until I learn about it. But getting me to the Get, point yeah. <laughs> where I want to learn about it can sometimes be, you know, that can be a to bridge to cross. I have to enjoy the artist as a person too in order True. to learn more about it. You know, I'm not going to sit and read about Picasso. I don't enjoy him. Yeah. I can study his work. I can think critically on his work and I can even enjoy some of it, but I'm not going to learn about him. Yeah, what I have learned about him, I don't like. Yeah, whereas with Felix, I felt a kind of kinship. So I was able to, okay, yeah, I don't really like this print, but man, this is a great, this is a great guy. And I want to learn more about him. So you do find, you know, out of the 300 pieces he made, I'll find 120 that I like. Hmm. And you can't always do that. Yeah. I mean, Picasso, Gauguin, like, no. Right. <laughs> um, what do you feel about the fact that he did die young? Uh, you know, his art career kind of ended at the height of his art career. And he, you know, he died of AIDS in 96. And so it wasn't like he was able to continue on making work. There is, you know, his... Um, catalog it is what it is yeah and i hate to say this but it's kind of like keith herring mm. it's their body of work was so of their time and was needed so badly in that time that if they were to keep going i hate to say it but i'm honestly kind of scared that it would cheapen the work and make it less impactful. Yeah. But because they passed away of such a terrible thing that could have been, if not prevented, then at least eased. Yeah. I think that the work would be, would have less weight. Yeah. And I mean, Keith Haring, Felix Claus Tours, there's a lot of similarities between their, their livelihood their style, their style, the way they, the their, way they carry themselves too. You know, Keith yeah. was—he believed art was for the people as well. He was drawing yeah. in subways. And even when he was famous, his, you know, the people who represent were like, "You got to stop drawing in subways." And he's like, "No, he got arrested for it." He, he drew all those. My first, um, first knowledge of him was as a kid because he did those great Sesame drawings Street. for Sesame yeah. Street. Exactly, like, just that. That great postmodernist ideal of of bucking against the system, bucking against any kind of authority. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that's a a good kind of introduction to Felix Gonzalez Torres as well as postmodernism. And that it's not just it's not just some bright blow up dog. Yeah. It's not what is, what is it a balloon animal mm, dog? Yeah. You know, Ugh. it's it's actually something that has a lot of thought behind it. And hopefully when you see it at a museum, you'll participate and you'll understand and enjoy it even more. Thank you for listening to our podcast. It means so much that you would take the time to listen to us. If you like what you hear and would like to help us out, please give us a review and like on your podcast app and iTunes. Comment and tell your friends and family. We would also like to thank the Joy Drops and Free Music Archive for our music. We want to have a conversation. This means that any research we do for a subject is often done a week or two before we record and our notes are minimal. This also means that as we talk about things, we might make mistakes, like in the pronunciation of names or the misattribution of a statement or a piece of work, and the messing up of titles and dates. If we do and we notice, we'll put a correction in the show notes. And if we don't, let us know so that we can. The best place to contact us is on our website, www.artsplanations.com. There you can find out more about us, the show, and each episode. You'll be able to find every artist quote and most of the specific vocabulary we use in each episode, as well as a list of upcoming topics. We invite you to join the conversation, so please let us know what you think. If you have suggestions or topics for discussion, you can let us know at our website, www.artsplanations.com. If you are curious about our artwork, the best place to find it is on our Instagrams. I'm at Andrew Malczewski, 
That's at A-N-D-R-E-W-M-A-L-C-Z-E-W-S-K-I. And I'm at Joanna.Bolsons.Artist. That's J-O-A-N-N-A dot B-O-L-S-I-N-S dot A-R-T-I-S-T. These links and others can be found on the Artsplanation website. That's www.artsplanations.com www.artsplanations.com